for years, the supernatural has been at the forefront of my life. It has helped me better understand the world and shaped me into who I am today. Now, I've set off to document one of life's greatest mysteries and challenge what I think I already know. So join us as we take you into the unknown. We're in Geelong, Victoria to investigate the old Geelong jail. Built in 1853. Many fear this place because of its aggressive and violent nature of its hauntings. But we can't wait to get inside and come face to face with the many spirits who are said to haunt this old jail. Originally Wathererong land, modern Geelong was discovered in the 1830s with the arrival of the first white settlers. Coming from Tasmania, they sought after new land to bring to life what would later become the head station for a major wool growing industry. Now home to the most heritage buildings per capita in Australia, Geelong also houses one of the oldest prisons in the country. From its beginning in 1853 to its closure in 1991, some of the state's most dangerous criminals called the Geelong Jail Home. Built to punish those who are not fit for society, rehabilitate any who could survive its brutal nature, and execute those who are too dangerous for the outside world. Now with over 500 confirmed deaths, those who survived this bluestone hell will forever be scarred, but the spirits of those who died will endlessly be serving their sentence. So, one of the other tour guides had come in, she said there were some strange things happening down here and I noticed that she'd left the side door open and I was about to go down and shut that because a lot of light comes in of a night time. And I was standing here and I just happened to look at the stairs and I saw a mist coming down the stairs. Two other people with me and, and they both saw the mist and then all of a sudden down the bottom of the stairs we saw feet, just feet. Feet? So shoes. So a pair of sneakers, solid just feet or solid sneakers, feet? just standing there, and we just sort of looked, and next minute it ran, and it ran out the side there. I was standing in there once, I was about here, and I was with, you know, there was a group of us, maybe ten of us, and I could feel my hair being like lifted up, yep. and then I'd been scratched on the neck. Really? In this cell, yeah. And that wasn't here, just here? That was, yeah, literally right here. Um, I guess so, like, one night I had a tour, and it was a pretty small tour. Um, we came in here and I told the morgue story, and as we were walking out of the here, it kind of felt like, not that we were being pushed, but sort of like forcefully guided out. Was this like physically, or you just felt compelled that you had no, to No, 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 like physically, like, and I've never felt it before, like someone was like, hurry up, get out, quick, keep going. And then the next day I woke up with these like really weird bruises on my arm that kind of looked like fingers. Really? From like where I'd been like shoved out. This attack convinced us that these inmates were not only violent in life, but violent in death. To gain a better understanding of who or what we could be coming up against, we had Deb, a local historian and tour guide, show us around. We are standing in the very centre circle. So the jail's built on uh, the Pentonville system, so it's built in a cross thing. And the reason that they uh, did it this way, is so a guard standing here in the centre can see all the way to the front gate, can see all the way to the back gate, and see down both wings. So we've got nearly 101 cells, mostly solitary. 
Uh, some uh, bigger cells are up on the third level, but yep. mostly solitary, yep. especially down here, because down here is where they kept the worst of the criminals. Would this have been a gun tower? Or? Um, no, that's just access to the roof. This is the okay. bell. So the bell, of course, is what regulated um, a lot of the, I mean, call their life. Kind of stuff. Yep, so are we able to morning them? master. Um, oh, I'm not it? sure I do every now and then. Oh. I don't know whether it's still working. No. <laughs> so, so that bell would have been used for wake yep. up, go to bed, yep. come meals, to meals, exercise, backyard, yep. everything. Yep. This Basically. Was, yep. This was the mother hen. Yep. It's what controlled everything. So. And do all of these doors open, or are some of them locked? Uh, some of them locked now, but. Yep. And it's interesting to note too that you know. This jail didn't close until 1991. So they're still quite primitive conditions. Yeah. And when you think a lot of the prisoners went from here uh, to Barwon, must have been like going to a five-star resort, that one. <laughs> oh, these were the same conditions yep. as the prisoners in the 1850s? Yep. So they shared the same conditions Exactly as it is years. here, this is how it was. Jesus Christ. In 1991. And one thing you'll notice with the cells is there's no toilets. Same conditions. Same conditions. With no upgrades in living conditions during its 138 year period, this meant that prisoners in the 20th century shared the same cells as prisoners of the colonial times. These barbaric living environments would lead inmates to desperate measures for freedom, with suicide becoming an all too common occurrence. Now another guy that we had that know, we know who threw himself off from the top level too is a guy called Percy Ramage. Um, now Percy Ramage was a local Geelong boy, uh, but he didn't deal with well with authority. We had one day, again in this 1901 period, where he attempted to commit suicide uh, by cutting his wrist with a, a shard of glass from his, uh, from his light. His screams kind of alerted the guards what was going on. They came in, they managed to get him sort of half shackled. He ended up running up here to the, to the third floor. He was a huge man. But he still managed to throw himself over. Uh, but because he, he'd already been shackled, he actually landed across one of the cross beams and um, managed to hang. Uh, by the shackles, so it was said that it dislocated his wrists and his shoulders, uh, but they left him hanging for about an hour before they got him down. So this is the gallows. Of the six executions carried out on the Geelong Jail gallows, the most notorious of cases belonged to convicted murderer James Murphy. Uh, so James Murphy was a 62-year-old, I think he was, uh, ex-soldier yeah. who was uh, convicted of murdering Constable Daniel O'Boyle down in the Warrnambool Courthouse. So he was uh, incarcerated on a, a very minor charge of horse stealing and Constable O'Boyle had got him to come over and help clean up one of the, the rooms in the courthouse yeah. in Warrnambool. Uh, instead he picked up a hammer and beat his brains in. So we believe he spent his last night in the condemned cell just here. In this one? Yep. 55. James Murphy. So, and this is who our depiction is supposed to be of. As a result of, these light, of, of all these deaths here, have there been any paranormal occurrences around here? We believe James Murphy is around a fair bit. James Murphy? Yep, so. Uh, do you think if we ask for James Murphy, he might come out and talk to us? He may do. Yeah. You can try. So yeah, try him and then you can try Edward. So, Edward? Yeah, Edward's the one that likes me. He usually hangs around in there. So, <laughs> fun and games. It's all fun and games until they hurt you. Strange occurrences were not only happening on the second floor gallows, but also in the east wing of the jail. It was in the 1860s that the east wing of the Geelong jail would be converted into an industrial school for girls. With the intention to bring young girls off the street and gain an education, these children were forced to live in the harsh environments of the jail, only a stone's throw away from violent criminals. 
With many of these girls dying within the jail walls, it's now believed that their spirits still wander these empty wings. We spoke to Andrew, who had a frightening encounter with the spirit of one of Geelong's forgotten orphans. So I came along and as was actually a participant in a tour. Yep. I came along, my mum was out from the UK, we were looking for something to do one evening, came along, did the tour, and the tour guide was talking about the industrial school for girls yep. that was here for about 10 years, late 1850s, early 1860s. And we're talking about the ages of between three and 16, these young girls were come off the street, orphaned. Mum and I went home and I actually said to Mum at the time, I have a feeling that something has come back with us. Almost like a, a young child. I just dismissed it after a couple of days and didn't think any, anything of it. However, a couple of nights after the tour, I was woken up with a tap on the shoulder, double tap on the shoulder. And distinctly, I thought it was my youngest daughter. So I turn over in bed about 2.30 in the morning. No one's there apart from my wife fast asleep. This happened on a number of occasions. And I thought I was absolutely, I just, I thought I was going mad. It was just one of those things. However, then my eldest daughter, who's nine, got up to go to the bathroom a few nights later, during the middle of the night. Next morning, she comes in to see us and she says to us, I saw my sister hanging around and playing at the end of the hallway. However, it didn't quite look like my sister. She had long blonde hair. Why, why would she have been out playing? And anyway, we unnervingly just said that that was probably her sister, yep. knowing full well what else had been going on. So anyway, with that experience of my daughter seeing it, who knew nothing about what had been going on at home or what my feelings as if I'd brought something back with me. Um, if it had been just me, fair enough. However, it was me, my wife that didn't come on the tour and my daughter that had knew nothing about it whatsoever. It was more about, I had a sense that they wanted um, a family, a siblings or some sense of belonging. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be loved and someone to belong to. I was standing on the other side, just up here, when I think the attachment happened. Just as we finished the se segment and I walked away was when I spoke to my mum and said how awful it was. And in my mind, I was thinking about my young daughters and I, that was the exact moment I'm sure that I had the attachment. When I walked away, more to the point when I walked away, I'd lost my fear. Right up until coming on the tour, having the attachment and the time in between, just a little bit unnerved, a little bit scared, in my mid 40s. I don't want to prove, tell anyone that I'm scared of anything. However, um, coming back here and helping to be, let's say, cleansed or a detached from the spirit that came to, came to me, um, I walked away from here feeling unafraid. Yeah. And now I have, I suppose my attitude now is that I'm accepting of what I've experienced and it's not scary, it's not unnerving, it's not necessarily frightening. It's hard to understand, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to put into words. I don't justify it, it's just what happened. And that tells me that there's something different to everyday life. The rushing around, the paying your mortgage, running a job, running your kids around, whatever it might be, um, there's something else other than that. And if you're open to it and accepting, then fair enough. Before our overnight investigation, we knew we had to get a deeper look into the horror and pain the jail still possesses years after its closure. We spoke to paranormal investigator Jose Rios, who was the victim of a malevolent attack by a spirit who is simply known as Ranga. So I was here a little while ago with myself, Kim and Ainsley just for some playtime. Yeah. Coming up the steps, talking to Ainsley about how he stinks and it's almost like an ammonia smell, like when you go to a men's urinal it really stinks. Yeah. 
Uh, that's the type of smell you get. And that was about where you are. And Kim was where I am. And Ainsley's closer to the cell. Yeah. And he just heard this. And I dropped. I was hunched over the handrail, exactly how Kim is. And my jaw just swelled up. I was, and I was here. I was right here. And you actually heard the impact. Kim turned around and said, what the fuck was that? And that's me just holding my jaw going, oh my God, I just got blindsided. Really? Yep. So you actually felt the impact? Oh yeah. You could hear it. You could actually hear the, the skin on skin contact. Jesus. And that was outside, was it cell was 70? Pretty much right here, cell 75. Do you think he was taking your comments as disrespect? Yes, because I do not like him. I don't like him, nor do I like pedophiles, hence why he probably done what he done. We were in here yesterday with Rachel. She said that he tends to pick on the weaker ones and gets intimidated and standoffish with the stronger ones, the ones yes. who show more authority. Yes. Stand their ground and in the spirit, he doesn't like that. So he'll go after the weaker ones, which is generally the females. If I push back, he cowers. Really? Yep. He will not. Uh, make himself known or if he does make himself known it's usually in that corner there mm -hmm. or on his bed yeah. and that's his real bed. Ranger is the name he goes by. Ranger. Ranger. Yep. Um, but implying he has red hair. Okay. Oh, red head. Yep. Okay. Um, he's the one that stinks and tries to run the show in here. And, that, and that's who the and that's who punched you, you think? Yes, I believe so, yes. Yep. And have you ever seen him? Do you know if he's tall, fat, short? I have never seen him, but I have smelt him. You smelt him? And he's disgusting. Um, I actually caught an EVP in here. An EVP, or electronic voice phenomena, is a digital recording of spirit voices and sounds. Um, now keep in mind, I'm not in the room, it's Kim. Uh, one kid who was on tour and his girlfriend. Oh, that is dirty. There you go. There you go. Tell me that's not Uncle Creepy, right? Yeah. So that's what we caught in here. Sounds like a snot nose little junkie. Yeah. Do you think he can hear his own voice right now? If he's in here? Do you, do you think he he's in here? I reckon he could. Um, I cannot smell him nor do I feel a presence in here at the moment. You do? Yeah. You can? Yeah. What do you smell? Just a bad odor. Yeah? Yeah. I uh, definitely smell a bad odor. Because that's his spot right there. Yeah. It's either that spot there or in the corner here. I can't smell it. Maybe it's... Maybe... Maybe it's me. No, maybe it's... I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's... He'll be a ranger. As soon as you mentioned the bad smell, I could smell it straight away. Yep. Do you think maybe when I moved in there, he might have? He probably moved. He was, he was a coward. Is it possible that playing this EVP of Ranger's voice in his cell has caused this sudden spike in activity? It's important to remember that one of the most common manifestations of the spirit is his alleged putrid stench. He's the one that stinks. Coming up the steps, talking to Ainsley about how he stinks. It's only seconds after that I ask if Ranger would be able to hear his own voice, that our on-set photographer picks up a certain stench while standing in what is said to be Ranger's corner. It's moments after this interview that Harvey notices three unexplained red marks on his forearm. Having worn a thick long sleeve jumper throughout this shoot, whilst having both hands occupied by holding the camera, there is absolutely no logical explanation for these three mysterious marks. We would later find out that this daytime spike in activity was only the start of something much darker. Jose's experiences went further than just the cells of the Geelong Jail. He took us to the morgue, where earlier we had spoken to Lee about her violent encounter with the spirit. So, the morgue. The morgue. It is in this morgue where each of the over 500 deaths at the Geelong Jail would be examined and processed. It is also where the spirit of Mary has been documented and is believed to still reside within its walls. I got to find 
the story of Mary a bit interesting. Yeah. Um, my three and a bit years or however long I've been here, little piece by piece of the puzzle started fitting. Long story short, Mary either died or um, was pregnant and died giving birth. Okay. In this room? Too. In this room or on the table. Do you know if Mary was, if Mary was an inmate or was she part of the schoolgirls? Um, I believe she was part of the schoolgirls. Okay. So she is, so she's a young woman? Yes, she's a young woman um, who fell pregnant to God knows who or what at okay. that era. Yeah. Um, but either died giving birth or died prior to birth, um, so they had to remove the child, okay. uh, which can be done. Yep. Um, we found her voice come through an EVP many times. So the general hauntings and activity in here is generally positive, it's not too negative in here? It's not too negative at all, no. Um, there was one instance where I thought was negativity. I was laying down in there and door was closed, myself, my partner, and about four other people in here during my thing was second or third tour. Mm. In that window right there. Which which panel was it? Uh, the one with the crack panel. The third from the right? No, yep. The second from the right? Yep. Um, that window right there stood a man. Stood a man, I'm leaning back and I could see him. With your head? With my head face. My head, head there, so my head's here, and my eyes are rolled back, and, and stood a man. You see a figure? I saw a figure right there. I got up and I made Usain Bolt look like shit. Really? <laughs> I left my whole crew in here. Yeah. I ran, I slammed the door and I took off. Really? Because I wasn't expecting it. So night has now come across the long, it's time for the investigation. Let's go. So we'll just lap it up a bit. Yeah? Sorry? We'll just walk around, walk around for a bit. get a feel. Okay, I just have noise in there, it's just the outside. Yeah. No matter how much time you spend uh, in these buildings during the day, <laughs> nothing prepares you for what it's like when you are in here on your own at night. All right, boys and girls, we are in here for the night. My name's Tama, this is Harvey. Hi, everyone. We're in here for a long time. Show us what you got. By ringing the central bell, I'm hoping the spirits will recognize its sound and elicit some activity within the jail, as this very bell was used to control all of the prisoner's movements during its operation. It's what controlled everything. We begin our investigation with a basic sweep of the east and west wing, seeing if we can pick up on any energy or strange occurrences. If there's anyone in here who wants to talk, make a noise at your cell. If you need anything, if you need water, if you need something to eat, we're on duty. Mm -hmm. Now within my head. 
Okay, it's all right. Got it. Got on this side now. We're in the early hours of our investigation, where during our initial walkthrough, my camera picks up what sounds to be a male's voice echoing through the wings of the Geelong Jail. This voice is not heard by either Harvey or myself, but is captured on both of our camera's audio. You can tell by the echo that this voice is coming from inside the jail and not outside noise bleeding through. Could this be a spirit of a former inmate taunting us from his cell, retaliating to my earlier comments? Show us what you got. With the spirits of the Geelong Jail starting to make their presence known, we head back down to the ground floor to begin our first experiment of the night. We set up in the east wing of the jail, which was once used as an industrial school for young females. It is also where a spirit of a little girl has been seen sitting on the stairs by local tour guides and guests. It is on these stairs that I place a digital recorder in an attempt to capture EVPs or electronic voice phenomena. We've been told that there's a little girl who comes to sit on these stairs here and watches people. You are a little girl who's here. My name is Tyler, this is Harvey. If there's anything you want to say, maybe it's the reason why you're here, why you can't move on, perhaps you don't know that you're dead. There's a red light right over there. I heard that. There's a red light over there. Say your name there for us. Whoa, there was a genuine orb that just flew straight in front of your hand really? and rushed off camera, yeah. Right hand, right hand. It was the hand that's outreached your right hand, yeah. Like maybe 10 seconds ago. Oh, and another one just flew past your left hand. It is not dust, there is something that keeps moving around your hands. Taking a closer look at this footage, we find that these strange light anomalies manifest from complete darkness and move on a conscious path ruling out the possibility of this being something solid, like a flying insect or dust particle. We can also prove that this is not a reflection coming from myself, as this anomaly's movement is not coherent with my own. What makes this event even more compelling for myself, is that at the exact same time as these light anomalies are captured, I can feel a cold air around my hands. It's commonly believed that sudden drops in temperature could indicate the presence of a spirit. It's not flying like dust. There's a little girl in here. It's generating its own light and it's moving around you. It's almost like it keeps swirling around you. If there's a little girl in here, you feel comfortable with me. Can you knock on the wall? Can you knock on the door? I need you to talk into that. I think the most compelling thing is that all that dust, well, what could be dust, has completely stopped.
still feel that swirly breeze around. It's at this exact moment that we capture an unexplained voice on our digital recorder. Here's the enhanced audio. Hello? Could this be a spirit of a little girl humming a song as she moves around the stairs? It's important to remember that leading up to this EVP, I feel cold bursts of air swirling around my hands at the same time our camera picks up strange balls of light. Oh, and another one just flew past your left hand. It's almost like it keeps swirling around you. If there's any last things you want to say, can you, I won't get in the way of the stairs. If you want to go up there and say something before I take that red light. It's me. It's your last chance before I turn it off. If you say something into that red light, we can hear it. We can learn more about you. Okay, there's any is anyone on the stairs now? I'm gonna grab it. Start to breeze. Whoa. <laughs> Incredibly, as soon as I ask for any spirits to move off the stairs, I feel a burst of cold air hit my right side, the same side that's facing the stairs. It's also at this exact same time that an unexplained ball of light is captured going across my right side. Whoa. In nearly an hour spent at these stairs, the only time we capture these mysterious balls of light is when they coincide with other manifestations. First, a swirling breeze around my hands, quickly followed by an EVP. I still feel that swirling breeze around. And now, on demand, as I ask for any spirits to move off the stairs, I'm hit with a burst of air on the same side that's towards the stairs, which is immediately followed by an unexplained ball of light running down my right side. Whoa. It's chains of events like these, which could further suggest the presence of a spirit. It's, it's almost like it just wants to be around you. Yeah. That was you, I see. That was me. Unless it was cell 94. Cell 94. During our earlier walkthrough, we were told of an inmate who was brutally murdered in this very cell, weeks before his release from the jail. I came into his cell and stabbed him to death. I'm getting a different feeling in here. There was this little dusty thing that just went across the frame. Mm -hmm. My name's Harvey, and I'm with Tama. We're two people which you have had every opportunity to get to know over the last three or four days. If you died here, come through and speak to me. What the hell was that? I have no idea. Only seconds after moving into the cell of a murdered inmate, we hear an immediate and direct response to our request for a manifestation. Our cameras pick up what we both hear to be what sounds like some kind of dragging sound coming from the ground floor. Come through and speak to me. What the hell was that? This unexplained sound is also captured on our static night vision camera. Come through and speak to me. It's moments after this, as we are on our way back down, that this same camera picks up what sounds like a child humming. All right, so right now we're about to go into the morgue. Now what, now what we're gonna do is something which we've never really done before. We're going to do a bit of role play, try to entice the spirits to come out and try to help us. I'm going to play the victim on the autopsy table. Harvey will play the role of the doctor.
by creating an environment that the spirits could be familiar with. We're hoping that they will respond to our request for help and encourage some intelligent activity within the morgue. If there's someone in here with us, I want you to communicate with me and I want you to do it to help the person who's lying on the autopsy table. If this is a medical emergency, what would you do? Is there a spirit in the room named Mary? During our daytime walkthrough, we were told of the spirit of Mary, who is said to haunt this morgue. It is as soon as we ask for Mary that I feel a cold pocket of air moving around my hands. Mary, our good friend. On your left hand. Both hands. They're checking for a pulse, maybe. Mary, are you checking for a pulse? Is there a nurse in here who's trying to help? Is there a Mary in the room with us? We'd like to connect with you. We believe you try and help people who perhaps lay down on this bed as you as Tama lays now. Again, as soon as we ask for the spirit of Mary, I feel the same cold air moving around my hands. Could this be her spirit? trying to comfort who she believes is a patient. Mary, that's you and some more reason to believe that you're here. You tap on the windows for us. <sighs> Do you hear that? What Harvey hears is captured on our static night vision camera. Here's the enhanced audio. There's a tap on a window down the corridor. It's very good, Mary. I need to bring the doctors in here. There's no room in the hospital. I can still feel the same breeze on the left hand. Are you holding my hand? Tell me that's going to be okay. It is at this exact moment that we capture an EVP in our digital recorder. Was this the spirit of Mary responding to my request for help? Or could it have been the dark entity that Jose saw in the room behind me, telling me to turn around? I saw a figure right there. With no further activity in the morgue, we decide to end our experiment and head to our most anticipated area of the jail, where earlier, two of my crew members had disturbing experiences that they both could not explain. Here we go. In an attempt to communicate with Ranger, we use an EMF meter, a digital recorder, and I tell Harvey to lie on the empty bed frame. It is said that Ranger is not only very territorial of the cell, but has been known to become violent towards those who touch this bed. By provoking this malevolent spirit, I'm hoping to force a reaction from him. Is there someone in the room with us? Someone that used to live in this cell?
We've heard your voice. We heard it in here yesterday. We played it out loud for you. So you might have heard it. People have caught you in here. We know that you know how to use it. Come and show us again. Was that your voice that we heard yesterday? One of our camera guys could smell you. As soon as you mentioned it, it's bad smell. Was that you? Was that you that he could smell? Make him get off your bed. Make the bed move. When are you It's almost like he doesn't want to play. I'm strange because I've been told that he likes to. I've been told he likes to be quite active in here. Mm. With Harvey being on your bed, mate, that's not a gift. You have to get him off. It looks like he's pretty comfortable on there. Is that your bed now, Harvey? Would you say? Or? Oh, I'd say it's my bed now. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I've taken over this one. Sorry, mate. You're going to be sleeping on the floor. You know, we got told that he doesn't like to deal with the tough guys. Maybe that's it. Maybe he's just scared of us. So why do you pick on the weaker ones? We've been told that you like to pick on girls and people who get afraid. I just throw a little ball of light shooting to me. If you were coming in to me, mate. You didn't come say all the time. Don't even fucking think about coming at me. I feel something on my back. Oh, I feel something up my oh my fucking god, I feel I feel a finger up my back. Provoking Ranger in a cell, taunting him to come out, I have the single most disturbing experience I've ever had. With my back against the wall filming Harvey. I first capture what looks to be a small anomaly shoot towards me. I just throw a little ball of light shooting to me. It's seconds after this that I feel a single finger slowly run up the right side of my lower back. Oh, I feel something up my, oh my fucking god, I feel, I feel a finger up my back. It takes me a few seconds to process what I'm feeling, but as soon as I recognise it to be a physical touch, I move away in shock. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous taunting Ranga in a cell, and this has now only escalated my initial fear. It's straight after this when Harvey complains about a burning sensation on his arm that our digital recorder turns off by itself. Did I just hear something go down? Did I just hear something go down? Yeah. Did you hear something? Yeah. What'd you hear? Like a... I need something Oh, fucking hell. Someone out here? You know, anyone else is in here. That aggression wasn't directed towards you. As all of you guys would have felt, you would have hated the pedophiles. We don't need to tell you that the rapists are the lowest. I reckon that you guys are probably on our side for that one. Would you agree? You know, I don't really agree with some of the things that you guys would have done, be it murder or robbery or whatever it is, but I think we can all agree 
that rape, uh, abuse towards kids, nah. So when people do that in life, and then in death continue to torment people, that's a big no. I think we can all agree with that. What do you guys think of the pedophiles? What do you think of the rapists? It's at this exact moment that my camera captures my greatest AVP to date. Here's the enhanced audio. What do you guys think of the pedophiles? What makes this EVP so compelling is not only the fact that it's a direct and intelligent response to my question, but also the tonality in which the voice comes through. It clearly sounds to be a male's voice with what sounds to be a very thick Australian accent. It's commonly known in the prison hierarchy that sex offenders are at the lowest of the list. To get confirmation from a spirit of a former inmate that his beliefs are still the same is an incredible piece of intelligent evidence. It's not until we are no more than 10 metres out of Ranger cell that our digital recorder, which has been dead for the last 40 minutes, mysteriously turns itself back on. Oi, what the fuck? What? The recorder's back on now. Now into the late hours of the investigation, we decide to investigate the gallows where for one full hour, I stand on the gallow doors, running on the spirit box. However, after documenting no further evidence and with the sun quickly rising, this would end our session on the gallows and ultimately conclude our investigation of the old Geelong jail. Built to punish the dregs of society, for over 130 years, the Geelong jail was a vessel of pain and trauma. Now 30 years on from its closure, it seems the dark history surrounding the jail still lingers within its walls. Experiencing the hauntings firsthand, it seems that many of its inmates are still serving time. It's, it's almost like it just wants to be around you. And may never be released. <laughs> 